I V M. Before we move on with this episode of the Scene in the Unseen, do check out another awesome podcast from IVM Podcast, Cyrus Says, hosted by my old buddy Cyrus Brocha. One of the things that most irritates me about political punditry in India is when people talk of our politics in terms of left wing and right wing. The thing is, this whole construct of left wing and right wing parties is a concept imported from the West and doesn't really apply to India. The truth is, all our parties are pretty much alike on the left right spectrum. Every party is left wing on economics, including the BJP, which, despite its recent rhetoric, believes in a big role for the state and may be pro business, but it is certainly not pro markets. In fact, between 2014 and 2019, there was nothing in Narendra Modi's economic management that was different from what Manmohan Singh would have done if in power, except perhaps for demonetization, which was reminiscent of Indira Gandhi. Arun Shori famously called the Modi government as UPA plus cow, but even cow is not really a differentiator, as the Congress resorted to soft Hindutva during its recent campaign and includes welfare schemes for cows in some of the states where it is in charge. In other words, all our political parties are left wing on economics and right wing on social issues, and therefore against individual freedom in every domain, much to the dismay of those like me who believe in individual rights. It is clear that much of our politics is based around identity. It is also clear that much of our politics is based around patronage and the bribery of voters, direct or indirect. Does this mean that ideology does not play a part in Indian politics? That is the conventional wisdom, and it is one that we shall examine critically in this episode of the Scene in the Unseen. Welcome to the Scene and the Unseen. Our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the Scene in the Unseen. My guest today is Rahul Varma, the co author with Pradeep Chibber of Ideology and Identity, a fantastic new book that makes the argument that, contrary to the assumptions of many, including myself before I read this book, Indian politics is actually deeply ideological in nature. Rahul is not related to me. Indeed, he is a Verma who spells his name V E R M A, while I am a V A R M A. His is the most common spelling, and it's a pet peeve of mine that so many journalists spell my name wrong with an E instead of an A. One could argue that my objection is rooted in identity. But I would say that is rooted in ideology, for it's a core philosophical belief of mine that we must respect all other individuals, especially when it comes to how they spell their names. Before I begin my conversation with Rahul on more serious matters of ideology and identity, let's take a quick commercial break. This episode of The Scene and the Unseen is brought to you by Storytel. Storytel is an audiobook platform which you can listen to on your Android or iOS app. They have thousands of audiobooks that you can listen to on your mobile, including hundreds in local languages like Hindi and Marathi. An unlimited monthly subscription costs only Rs. 2.99 per month. And you can also get a 30 day free trial if you hop on over to storytel.com slash IBM. I actually use Storytel myself regularly, so as long as they sponsor the show, I'm going to recommend one book a week that I love. The book I want to recommend today is The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. If you enjoyed the TV series, consider that this audio version of the novel is read by Elizabeth Moss. Check it out on Storytel. And remember, you get a 30-day free trial only at storytell.com slash IVM. Rahul, welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. Thank you. Rahul, tell me a little bit about uh, your background, like what were you trained as? Were you an economist, a social scientist? What got you into this field? So I'm a trained political scientist. I'm completing my PhD from University of California at Berkeley. Currently, I'm a fellow at the Center for Policy Research. Uh, what got me interested into politics? Frankly, I don't know. I was interested in elections and politics as a child. Perhaps so as a child, I was a sort of like, like most kids, I was a very naughty character. Where was this? Uh, you were... uh, so I was born uh, very close to Ayodhya, uh, okay. a small town uh, in my village, which is very close to Ayodhya. So growing up, uh, I basically witnessed two political phenomena that changed India forever. I, I didn't understood those two phenomena then, the Mandal politics as well as uh, the Ram Mandal politics. So literally my first memory of Ram Mandir agitation and mobilization was that you can see buses with policemen 
and all these policemen what they do is basically eat banana and throw on the road uh later on i figured out banana is a high energy fruit and you know that's why uh, these policemen eat it but that's that's my memory of a curfew when when you see a curfew you will see lots of policemen in buses and they will be basically eating bananas for them out <laughs> so as a kid i used to do all uh, tamasha during the day so during summer vacations my father basically asked me to read newspapers and in the evening when he'll come back from his office i have to tell him what is on the front page what is on the sports page and so i as a child was just as four five or six i started reading newspapers out of fear that i'll get sort of scolded in the evening if i don't do my homework so i used to do a homework on on newspapers and i used to read uh, so uh, because i was growing up in up uh, at home i was getting hindi newspapers so both on the sports page as well as on politics page i used to hear funny proper nouns right like in up there is a constituency uh, near uh, mirzapur uh, which was roberts ganj <laughs> and you know as a 4 5 year old kid i was like roberts i had heard in hindi movies so why is there a roberts ganj or if you read a hindi newspaper all these terms are spelled very uh, like leg before wicket is is pagbadha and you oh, know okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> these are, these just used to sound funny in my head and and uh, uh, so i i think that's how i got interested in politics uh, uh, reading about them sort of making a notebook both of cricket scores so cricket and and politics both uh, ha- also have a component of numbers say like if you to win elections you have to be right on the numbers so i used to sort of maintain a notebook for a very long period of time on both cricket scores and on both uh, political scores and somehow i think that got interested me in politics and, and do you think just thinking aloud do you think that unlike other english speaking elites like myself for that matter who, who I, i mean i grew up just reading english newspapers unfortunately did the fact that you were uh, reading hindi newspapers day in and day out since you were a kid did that give you a slightly different understanding of politics from the people who are your peers today so i don't know that but even today i order a hindi newspaper and if you look at hindi newspapers their coverage is very different from what you get in english newspapers so i don't know about a different perspective but i certainly get to see more things than what get covered in a hindi newspaper the editorials uh, in hindi newspapers are very very different on very different subjects and i i remember couple of years ago there was a debate in couple of english newspapers by ram guha sagarika and other people basically writing on on this topic why don't we have conservative public intellectuals and my answer was perhaps you don't read vernacular newspapers because your point is we do uh, we do they they just don't write in english yeah. if you read marathi newspapers if you read kannada newspapers so in fact because i i i have been reading hindi newspapers so i i know hindi public intellectuals who are have conservative view point and then i asked my other friends who read marathi or kannada newspapers and they said we do have these things mm. so i think certainly you have a very diff- you get a very different point of view by reading vernacular uh, language newspapers so you know as you as you kind of grow up and then you uh, got into the academics of it as well uh, who are the sort of thinkers who influence the way you think about politics in the world are there any books that you can recommend to my listeners or books that you feel change the way you think about the so world there is a long list of both thinkers and uh, books that have influenced me um uh, i so i'm a political science or politics nerd so you know i, I read things uh, i i don't know there's no time of either reading or or sort of like uh, working on things but so if you think of good indian political scientist who people should read perhaps in the older generation uh, rajni kothari uh randeer singh who was a big marxist uh th- theorist uh if you have to read uh, contemporary people i think pratap bhanu mehta who writes in indian express is one of our foremost uh, political philosophers i think uh, yogendra yadav still uh, when he sort of like despite being in politics i think uh, some of his writings are very 
illuminating. There were some social scientists who were American, but they worked on India. Uh, Myron Wiener's work on Congress Party, Child in the State, uh, Migration and Nativism. Uh, I think uh, uh, Suzanne and uh, Lloyd Rudolph's work on, on the political economy of Indian state. So there are lots of uh, political scientists uh, who have influenced. Uh, I think I, I also read a lot of Hindi fiction. Uh, so if people want to sort of like uh, Rag Darbari is one classic Srilal Shukla, but Mela Achal, we were talking about Kas, Kasi Kasi, Kasi. Kasi Nath Singh. Uh, so I, one advice which I got from my PhD advisor that if you're not getting idea, read fiction. So don't read too much political science, but also read fiction. And I think fiction, poetry makes you think about things in a very different context. So I, I love reading uh, poetry. I grew up in a small village, but my schooling was from Lucknow. So there is some influence of Lucknow. I think even uh, like I, I have always been fascinated by two line share or uh, six line couplets, which basically tries to bring a very, very complex thought into say 10 or 12 words, right? Uh, so I, I do think people, perhaps Dhumil, I don't know, there have been so many poets who have influenced me. Generally, uh, I think, uh, so I, I don't read much political philosophy. Uh, perhaps uh, later in my life, I'll do that. But as part of course curriculums, I have read, I think, Hobbes, Rousseau, Locke, and all of these have made influential uh, points. Uh, what books people should read, uh, uh, I, I think uh, read as much as you can uh, and uh, just look at like top 50 uh, novels in your language which you are comfortable with or top uh, 50 novels in English. Um, I, I don't, don't know what names to give to you but... No, fair enough. And, uh, you know, uh, what you said definitely strikes a chord with me because I haven't read remotely as much in Hindi as you obviously have. But, you know, if someone were to ask me, how do we understand India of the 1960s and 70s? And I would say there is no better book than Ragdarbari. Hmm. How do we understand the nature of the Indian state? I would say there is no better book than Ragdarbari. You hmm. can pick up books by historians and political theorists and all that. But the sort of magic in a good work of fiction hmm. uh, that, you know, captures society. And uh, Raghdar Bari, incidentally, is available on Storytel, who are the hmm. uh, sponsors right now of The Scene and the Unseen. So you can actually listen to it in Hindi over there, even if you're not comfortable uh, uh, reading the language. So sort of moving on from there, uh, you know, uh, let's come to the book that we're talking about, um, which you've co-written with uh, Pradeep Shibbar, Ideology and Identity. How did you come to this subject? So Pradeep Chibber, he's my PhD advisor. Uh, he's a professor of political science at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Pradeep is considered one of the foremost experts on uh, party politics and party systems. Uh, and he has written some uh, very interesting books uh, on party systems. Uh, but before this book, he wrote another book, which I think didn't uh, get attention. The title of the book is Religious Practice and Democracy in India. And what he shows in that book, that uh, religious practice in India, especially the public, uh, uh, so uh, this is all based on uh, on data, survey data. So people who go to, say, religious sites such as temples, uh, gurdwaras, mosques, churches, and people who participate in religious services such as bhajan, kirtans, and uh, 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 jalsas, and, and church services, their outlook towards democracy is much more positive than those who don't practice religion. Yeah. And idea is basically that all other sources which links individuals to the state are sort of captured. So if you think of or captured or, or not working properly, right? Basically, you have a capricious state in India. Bureaucracy is discretionary and sort of like uh, discriminates. Political parties have been captured by vested interests. It is religion or religious places which even for moments provides equality to people from all walks of life. And that's mm -hmm. why those who participate in it, they think that the democracy in the country is functioning much better. 
So Pradeep, generally, and I think uh, this is largely, I wouldn't say a norm, but slowly getting more traction uh, that uh, so in natural sciences or in engineering, people, they don't write solo author pieces. Uh, you will always see five, six, eight, ten people writing this. Social sciences was generally where people were doing solo work. But nowadays, given there's a lot more emphasis on sort of like data related work, and this basically brings uh, much more collaboration than earlier. And there, I think I see much more collaborative work happening between not just professors, but professors and their mentees and students. So Pradeep generally works with all of his students. Uh, uh, so I am not an exception to the uh, large community of scholars he has been sort of producing uh, in last 10, 20 odd years. Uh, so we were writing a couple of opits and Pradeep generally likes to take a walk when he wants to discuss something, right? Uh, so he loves running. Uh, and so I think this was around Independence Day. We were in Berkeley and somehow the conversation started happening that there is a long shadow of partition, right? Basically, same themes emerging every five, six years, uh, the debate on majoritarianism or how to accommodate religious minorities into body politic. The debate on reservation resonates every time. So we thought that, and these were some of the founding debates we were having at the time of independence. And so I think the idea starts uh, started germinating from there. So during the 2014 elections, what we did is wrote a series of opits on six, seven chapters, which you see in the book. Basically, we tested our idea in 1,200 words each. And once we got enough reactions, so we, we did start with the classic economic and social ideology framework. Uh, that's where we started. And in the data, there wasn't any difference in the economic. So, so there was a difference on the social ideology or social conservatism. But between parties, there was no difference on the economic ideology front. And then we started wondering why we don't see the other dimension, which is so much prevalent in Western Europe and, and North America. And, and that got us into thinking, perhaps either our polity is one dimensional or there is a second dimension, but there is something unique about our own historical and cultural context. And, and we started reading about things and, and, and that's how the collaborative process began. I was struck by a quote which actually comes towards the end of your book, but kind of sums up the conventional wisdom which your book is questioning. And it's a quote from the Italian Giovanni Sartori. Quote, ideology does not strike roots in all types of soil. And while there is very little evidence to the effect that ideological factors do have empirical relevance in African contexts, it is abundantly clear that most of what is spoken as ideology is mere political rhetoric and at the same time image selling to Western public. Stop quote. And this applies to India as well. And early on in your introduction, uh, you guys write, quote, Contemporary Indian party politics is commonly viewed as chaotic, centered around leaders, corrupt, volatile, and non-ideological in nature. What accounts for this perception and for the corollary view that elections in India are rarely, if ever, genuine contests of ideas, policies, and visions? Um, uh, stop quote. Uh, so, why does this perception then then kind of exist? So... The couple of, uh, so apart from this quote, there was another uh, interesting, uh, I think, letter to the editor in New York Times or somewhere where someone basically went on a rant uh, that, you know, Indian political parties uh, are just alphabets, one lot siding with the other lot. Uh, it's not a solemn selection of leader of 1.3 billion, but like a children's game show. But if you if you remember 2014 election or 2019 election, both the Congress party leaders, the top leaders in the Congress party, as well as BJP leaders were in fact unequivocally saying that this is a fight or battle for the soul of India or, or uh, this is a fight between two ideas of India. So politicians perhaps realize these are ideological battles. But in our scholarly context, journalistic context, we thought voters do not... So there is no structure or framework to our politics. People just vote on their whims or they get something uh, and in exchange of uh, those favors, they vote 
a particular political party or politician so we don't want to go that route and we tried to avoid as much as we could we didn't want to go on a rant against this whole perception uh, of that indian politics is non ideological uh, but we do wanted to make a point that any departure from how politics is conducted in west is seen as primordial or the politics in west is structured around ideas whereas politics in developing world is uh, just taking some samosa some liquor some sari and voting for the or tribal so instincts is, yeah, and so on yeah so so we were sort of like bugged with this sort of characterization of, about indian politics and and this is what is giovanni sartori is one of the foremost political scientists uh, he's a classic on party systems and i like his writing when i read this uh, stuff i thought this should go in in our book because this is what we are sort of like challenging that we may not uh, developing countries like india or post colonial countries like india may not have the same structure of politics as the west but the departure should not be understood as these countries there is no framework to our politics so i think that was sort of like beginning of of why we wanted to sort of take on on this argument the perception has remained is is i i think what we would like to describe as a fake fact of politics there is no basis to make that claim but once that claim started gaining ground it became sort of a truism or a normal assumption about our politics no and and what it strikes me and this is even a mea culpa of sorts in the sense that uh, this perception this looking at indian politics through a left right prism through a fundamentally western prism and saying that oh okay it doesn't function along this prism therefore it is um, sort of non ideological and it's on all these other factors uh, uh, which is one that i have held for so long and your book is making me reconsider uh, really comes from uh mostly from political thinkers or theorists or columnists or pundits who are a part of the english speaking elite whose education is kind of western whether mm. it is in the west or here and as you pointed out earlier in the episode you've grown up reading hindi newspapers and therefore it's you weren't exactly captured by the elite mm. in that sense you also had uh, access to uh, expressions of different contestations and uh, you know a different uh, set of intellectuals um from where you came before we kind of proceed by talking about the book i think it's kind of useful to uh define some of the terms because they get confusing you you so for example define ideology okay uh, but i just wanted to sort of get back to one point sure. uh, which is basically this departure from the west democracy is sort of understood and defined very differently in the context of west whereas democracy in the context of post colonial and underdeveloped countries is always defined with an adjective right that is this is not a perfect democracy it has become a ethnic democracy it has become something like that but if you come to think of it india is one of the busiest laboratories of democratic politics and i think now so in us when we used to make presentations not just me but many times uh, if people who work on say south asia or africa or some other country uh, there would be a general question and this is a legitimate question how far does your theory travel to other parts of the world and and sometimes in my irritation i used to basically if not in public i i do used to say that i don't care if it doesn't travel in every theory we own one sixth uh, right so given the size of of our population we now need to sort of like the theory of democracy now needs to move out from the best west and and see how it is being practiced in a country like india or a bangladesh or or say philippines and those theories now sort of like needs revision and no i get what you're saying and there's a certain condescension there from people on the west who are sort of saying that here's our theory and our theory is paramount and does it fit you or does it not and but asking different questions of your theory where you actually have to kind mm. of prove mm. that it travels as you said which i can understand why you were uh, irritated by it getting back to ideology let let's talk about uh, you know since your book is centered around uh, ideology uh, define it for me so 
we take a very sort of like watertight definition of what we consider as ideological conflict, right? Uh, which is basically an issue bundle. Uh, uh, and many of these issues go together. And voters take basically position on, on these issues. So it might happen that you care about one issue more than the other, but because it is part of your issue bundle, you will have some position closer to your uh, preference. But for anything to become ideological and structure party politics, we claim that it must meet four conditions. One, every election can have a very different issue which drives that election. But for something to become the basis of ideological conflict, it needs to be stable for a long period of time. Because it is an idea, it must have an intellectual origin. Uh, there must be people uh, or in intellectuals, e elites, writing about it, debating about it, and talking about it. So the second criteria is, is it must have an intellectual basis. Third, to reach that idea to masses, it needs channels of transmission from political or social elites to masses. Fourth, it must have enough number of people on each side of the divide. Because unless that happens, you won't see political parties taking a clear stand on, any, uh, on that issue. And that wouldn't become a basis of ideological conflict. And I think to think about why we make this argument that the Indian version of ideological conflict is, is very different because those ideas are born out of historical experiences and trajectories. And the historical experience of the West and a post-colonial country like India was very, very different. And that's why our ideological conflict are going to be very, very different. And that's a very fascinating part of your book where you kind of elaborate on uh, the four different ways in which ideology as the West understands it is formed in West and why none of those apply to India because of a completely different set of circumstances and histories. Can you elaborate on what those four ways are? Uh, so this is a very famous thesis by Lipset and Drokhan and, and those are two f great political scientists. Uh, uh, so the claim they make that the West European party system is frozen in four cleavages. The four cleavages were basically labor versus capital, rural versus urban, center versus periphery, and church versus state. Those were the four sort of like main cleavages on which party politics in West Europe happened. And it happened because West Europe underwent a historical trajectory of first uh, Renaissance, Reformation, then Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution produced capital, uh, labor divide. It also, because of Industrial Revolution, it also created an urban-rural divide. Uh, there was always a center-periphery issue going on in, in many parts of those countries. And the church and state thing comes from Renaissance Reformation. A country like India never underwent this historical experience. Overnight, we became an independent nation state from a colony. So for us, while nation building debates were happening in the background, but we suddenly become an independent or sovereign country uh, within a matter of night. And at the time of independence, most of these countries like India was so poor, so rural, that you cannot have a politics on these cleavages. In fact, when Nehru stands in the Constituent Assembly to begin the objective resolution, he basically begins with that the first task of this assembly is to clothe the naked, feed the hungry. So the state, in a sense, there was a consensus that the state is going to take the burden of poor, right? And that's why we don't see divide on economic ideology. There may be a minor differences on the route to welfare model, but I don't think any political party, as you said, in India is pro-market in that sense, right? We don't have market versus state debate among our political parties, barring, I think, uh, the communist parties, which has a clear, at least written uh, prescription, but I don't know whether they follow the same thing uh, uh, on the ground. So the two axes could not have, so, so they didn't take off. The center-periphery debate could have taken off, uh, and there were riot-like situation. In fact, 
on the question of integration of various parts of India. And I think that problem got in some ways resolved by the reorganization of state uh, into linguistic provinces. So language politics now was just centered within the state, not vis-a-vis the uh, center. So I think there were some steps taken in 1950s and 60s, which restricted the center state fight emerging as a central issue of basically as a national issue in that sense. It, it remained localized. So you would see uh, in Tamil Nadu a fight with Delhi or in Jammu Kashmir a fight with Delhi, but that does not become a mobilizing plank across India, especially in the large parts of Hindi heartland. The fourth, in India, we never had that kind of centralized church. Hinduism never had that kind of It's very diffused, almost yes. outsourced. Yes. So we never had a church versus, at the time of independence, there was no church versus state conflict that was happening. But we could in some way sort of like argue that religion or accommodation of uh, religious minorities did become a meta narrative of Indian politics and it does resonate still today. Right. So you kind of pointed out and I found your arguments quite convincing and obviously agree with them that these four sort of ideological cleavages of the West don't apply to India. However, you say this does not mean that India does not have ideological contestations and you talk about two specific ideological battlegrounds which have been ideological battlegrounds for decades and and therefore they are stable and they meet all your other conditions of the ideology that they are stable. They have intellectual elites on both sides. They are propagated through uh, all the various uh, kind of means. To tell me what those two are. So we are, we basically argue that Indian politics structured by two ideological scales. One, we describe it as politics of recognition, uh, which is basically the idea of bringing different groups into the body politic and what would be the method of accommodation. Uh, so debates on reservations and quota whether the Indian state should hew to majoritarian characteristic, that basically forms the bulk of uh, uh, basis of politics of recognition. And if you read the Constituent Assembly debates, these were the questions on which our founding fathers, uh, there were very few women in the Constituent Assembly, so uh, founding fathers were debating about. Uh, the debate on cow slaughter, like I think began in 1909 or something, where members in the Constituent Assembly are quoting statistics that there were so many thousand cows in the northwestern frontier provinces and now their population has decreased to this and that's why there is a cow slaughter happening. They will invoke Gandhiji and, and you know... Uh, Gandhi so, himself. So, so, yeah, so yeah. Constituent Assembly, you, you were having these things. Uh, similarly, the debate on reservations started way back in 18... I think 1882... So there were some ramblings earlier also in Mysore, in Kolhapur and in, in Trivandrum. Jyoti uh, by Phule. Yeah, yeah. But in 1882, I think Hunter Commission, so so there was a representation by Phule to Hunter Commission for affirmative action for Dalits and backwards uh, in the education sector. And I think that debate on reservations began there. Then it took another shape during the Monte Merlo reforms, Mongeu Chemsford reforms, Gandhi Ambedkar debate. A large part of Constituent Assembly debates were on the reservations, 1950s Kalilkar. So I, I think throughout last hundred years, we had spurts of moments where the debate on reservations were happening for different communities. And I think now with the BJP's final soap, in fact, the reservation bill for economically weaker section, this this is the first time it has been passed. But at different times, various governments have tried to bring this bill, which is what it is doing is changing the nature of the debate on reservation from sort of historical reparation and social justice to economic backwardness. So, so there's a very different twist that is being given by BJP on the reservation. In fact, this particular twist is almost one which takes it from your first ideological cleavage, which is to do with recognition, to your second one, which is to do with statism. Uh, so not necessarily, but 
because uh, it's uh, again about the state sort of remaking the economy or society by uh, this kind of uh, uh, you so, so so we have a very particular understanding uh, of what do we mean by statism and I, I do acknowledge that it may not fully encapsulate what is happening so in our view the role of the state in society has a very different conception in western political thought and indian political thought in the west society basically makes the state to sort of like reorganize it so that's the Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau tradition. Whereas if you read Indian political thinkers and the classic textbooks such as sort of like Mahabharata, Shastra. So I think the state society conception in Indian political thought is very, very different. And, and perhaps there is a reason why we don't have a good theory of state and we don't have a good theory of kingship. In fact, uh, in, in all our texts, there is things written about what a good king should do and what a bad king would do. But why do we need a king? The theory of kingship is not well established in Indian political thought. So the way these most of these thinkers, not just limited to the Hindu tradition, but it seems like a subcontinental idea uh, and you find resonance of this in some ways in Buddhist thought, Islamic thoughts, as well as an, uh, in Hinduism where the role of the state or the king is to act as the guardian of the society. So the state and king cannot sort of like, they should protect the social norms, but they should not be trying to remake the society. And they should not even sort of like have redistributive impulse, basically taking away property and then redistributive. In fact, if you think about Gandhian idea of trusteeship, it was based on the same notion. This is not the job of the state to take away property from people who have it and, and so basically changing social economic norms. And I think, and this is what, what emerges from constituent assembly debates and debates that were happening on a Hindu court bill at that moment of time, was that people like Ambedkar and Nehru wanted to use the levers of the state to remove the inequalities in our social and economic life. And then there were other members in the Constituent Assembly who were opposed to these ideas. Uh, they thought that this is not the job of the state to remake the society. And like, like you explained in your book, it comes, I mean, this whole conflict in a sense comes from differing perceptions of what is the relationship between the state and the society. As you say in your book, Quote, in Western political theory, Rousseau, Locke and Hegel are good examples. Political order means a subjugation of society to the state. So, you know, you might have a state of nature there, but for society to function, you need the state to protect individual rights and so on. That's Western political theory. But to give the contrast to that with, you know, what is contained in Indian conservative thought, you quote Karpatri Maharaj and I'll uh, quote this. Uh, Karpatri Maharaj's words, uh, quote, in Indian tradition, the society is always supreme and the ruler is accountable to dharma and society. The administrator and administration keep changing, but not the society and dharma. The laws of the state always have to be favorable to religious texts, top quote. So in that conception, society already exists. It is prior to the state and then the state comes in and the state is like uh, sort of an administrative convenience. That's absolutely correct. So, so in this conception, the role of the state is just a facilitator. There is permanent feature, which is society. And the interesting feature about this whole conception is that there may be some sort of like deformation or bad things that may appear in the society. Now, the the state should not be sort of intervening to remove those bad things. The society would itself heal up or will come up with solution, right? So, so think about the problem of untouchability, right? Gandhi never said the state to sort of like take the law in hand and remove untouchability. Gandhi basically goes in the society and says, this is a bad thing, we need to reform it, right? So, so in this framework or the model, the reform has to come within the society. The state should not be using a violent mean or a danda to sort of like 
correct things. In fact, one of my favorite uh, quotes about politics is by Andrew Breitbart, where he says, politics is downstream of culture. Hmm. And it, it would seem that that represents sort of huh. the traditional Indian view. And it's also very interesting that then the people fighting for statism, as it were, the state intervening in the economy and in society, were essentially Western educated liberals like Nehru and Ambedkar. That That is correct. That is correct. And Karpatri Maharaj, he's a very interesting character. And I hope some political theorist works on him. So Karpatri Maharaj was the founder of Ram Rajya Parishad. This was an orthodox Hindu party in 1950s, which slowly sort of got merged into Bharatiya Jan Sangh. So the quotes are coming from Karpatri Maharaj. He wrote, uh, I think, more than 1,000 page book. And the name of the book is Marxwad or Ram Raj. Uh, and he basically is sort of like challenging not just the Marxist interpretation of the state and society, but he takes on all possible Western philosophers in that. And, and a lot of it is, uh, in, in some ways, you can call it uh, basically polemic and, and uh, rhetoric. But then somebody is sitting in the jail and, and, and writing these thousand pages uh, as, as Indian political is, thought. Is the I translation think. of it uh, available in So I have not seen the English translation. I've seen the Hindi one. Mm. Uh, it, and it is sold by Gita Press. Yeah, which is interesting, which connects me to both a past episode and a future episode. I did an episode a few weeks back with Suyash Rai of uh, Carnegie. And he mentioned your book in uh, his discussion with me. And he mentioned uh, this book uh, by Karpatri Maharaj. And I'm doing a future episode with Akshay Mukul, which should be out in a few weeks on the Gita Press. He's written an incredible Very book on the Gita Press. So uh, that should be fairly interesting. And and, and you kind of, you, then you talk, you've got another quote from Gandhi, quoted by Masani, but a quote from Gandhi in your book, which is, uh, quote, I look upon an increase in the power of the state with the greatest fear, because although apparently doing good by minimizing exploitation, it does the greatest harm to mankind by destroying individuality, which lies at the root of all progress. Stop quote. And, you know, here he's almost coming down on the side of the traditionalists. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, so tell me a little bit. So these are the two sort of ideological contestations you've identified. There is a politics of recognition and there is a politics of statism. Let's talk about both in turn. Let's talk about statism first. What are the sort of debates taking place around statism at the time of the Constituent Assembly? Because it's not as if Gandhi and Ambedkar are getting their view. There's mm. a pushback. And in fact, the cover of your book is really fascinating. As you pointed out, it's a picture of um, Nehru's first cabinet. And um, uh, the fascinating point you made is that if you just look at them, you know, uh, left to right, uh, they almost represent where they stand ideologically with Nehru yes. in the center, yeah. Shama Prasad Mukherjee on the extreme right, and then you have uh, Vallabhai Patel and uh, yes, Rajendra yes. Prasad. And on uh, the extreme left, you have Dr. Bhim Rao. Uh, and on the extreme left, you have uh, Dr. Ambedkar and almost representing sort of uh, the very two cleavages that you talk about, hmm. uh, you hmm. know, uh, where you, you could say that uh, the guys on the right, like Shama Prasad, and are against the sort of statism and the intervention hmm. uh, yes. that these guys do. And the guys, uh, like, you get to the left, you get to Ambedkar, and that's probably the extreme when it comes to recognition, though not remotely as extreme as so many people today, uh, hmm. Hmm. Know, which is quite interesting. Tell me about the battles around statism. So, So if you think of 1940s and 50s, uh, statism basically implies uh, using the power of the state uh, to change social and economic norms. Uh, by social norms, you can take, for example, marriage norms, uh, inheritance norm, and uh, and uh, economic would be, say, uh, redistribution of private property. Now, the best example of this debate could be found in the debates that were taking place on Hindu court bill. Uh, in fact, uh, there was so much vociferous opposition to the Hindu court bill that the debate started in, I think, 1940s and it ends in 1956 when Nehru, in fact, had to break down the Hindu court bill into four parts and then get it passed through the parliament. But before that, uh, uh, I would sort of like the hell broke loose. Uh, Ambedkar thought that Nehru is not serious enough. Uh, on the Hindu court bill because he thought this is very, very important to give women uh, uh, equal place in the society. 
and given Nehru's non-seriousness on the matter, he in fact resigned from Nehru's cabinet. Perhaps Nehru had different plans and didn't sort of talk, uh, uh, took Ambedkar in confidence on that. But before this Gandhi uh, Nehru Ambedkar battle, Purushottam Das Tandon in 1953 became the president of the Congress Party, and he was one of the traditionalists who was opposed to the Hindu Court Bill. And Nehru knew with him being the president of the Congress party, this would not work. And in a way, Nehru had to revolt, use his charismatic personality and power of the prime minister to sort of ask for Shotam Dastan to step down. So there was battle within the Congress party, within the government on this question of Hindu court bill. And what was Hindu court bill? Basically trying to sort of like codify marriage and inheritance norms. And similarly, on the question of redistribution of private property, uh, both, I think, Nehru had the inst- not just the instincts, but he pushed for reforms, uh, land reforms, right? And look at the kind of opposition it met. Uh, there was sort of a compromise on this. India was, I think, one of the first countries to have right to property as fundamental rights. And this was a sort of like, pushback traditionalist gave back in the Constituent Assembly that they got right to private property as a fundamental right. And Nehru, on the other hand, wanted to push the land reforms and and, and, and in, in some ways it, it failed. So those were the, like two big debates that happened in 1950s. And, and, and now, of course, the right to property is no longer a, um, a fundamental right. And this is something I had an episode on with Shruti Rajgopal and I think it's episode 26. Commend me for my memory. Episode 26 of The Seen and the Unseen. I'll link it from the show notes. Uh, and it's interesting how both Karpatri Maharaj and Maulana Madhudi, one of the founding um, uh, thinkers of Islamism, uh, both opposed uh, this kind of redistribution and this kind of uh, statism. And and you kind of wonder, you know, when you talk about, and this is a question I ask many of my guests, that when we debate sort of the idea of India, that fine, you know, Nehru's idea of India, uh, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't agree with, but Nehru's idea of India won out uh, in, in those founding years, partly because uh, he uh, happened to be uh, a giant of the freedom movement and therefore he was in that position and partly because of happenstance that other uh, figures from within his party, like the traditionalist Hindu wing of his party, sort of uh, got sidelined after Vallabhbhai Patel died in 1950. Then, you know, he made Pushyottam Das Tandon step down because he wanted Kripalani uh, to be uh, Congress president and that wing kind of just uh, uh, faded away. But... My question is this, that before we arrive at what the idea of India should be, and it's basically a bunch of elites debating that and deciding that, it is also perhaps interesting to question what is India? Hmm. And should the idea of India reflect what India is? And did that idea of India reflect what India was? I mean... um, you know, uh, uh, later on in time, the India Alupadhyay made the point that the constitution does not reflect India, that mm-hmm. it's been foisted by sort of liberal Western elites and so on. And this is then a question that I've asked various people on this podcast, including Soyash, including Shashi Tharoor a while back and various people. So I'll ask you now that, uh, uh, you know, how do we resolve this? That let's say uh, that, uh, you know, we might welcome the idea of a liberal constitution. But if the liberal constitution is imp- is something imposed by elites, by liberal elites on a country which is fundamentally illiberal, uh, and I don't necessarily use that in a bad way, but yeah. it, which is fundamentally not liberal, mm-hmm. then is that imposition itself not illiberal? Uh, so that's a uh, good question complicated question and I don't think I have a good answer to it but let me try I think so first uh, we must remember uh, so this idea of India term got popularized by after Khilani's book but and, and and I think one doesn't need to do a very careful reading just a cursory reading will tell you that Khilani talks about ideas of India he basically says that there were multiple ideas of India the idea of India makes the case and that's why he's writing about it because he thinks the idea of India represents the diversity uh, of, of, of not, not just the diversity of the population but only the idea of India allows all other ideas to exist simultaneously. So, 
so so in that sense uh, uh not just diversity but pluralism where you sort of like multiplicity multiplicity of thoughts can sort of coexist um and perhaps we sh- so so in the book in the conclusion uh and this is a sort of like a thought experiment we borrowed from ashutosh vasne uh, which is basically think of like 1940s india on uh, you had three strong contenders for power uh vallabhai patel on one hand and and uh, nehru on the uh, in, in between and then you have bose on the other hand uh bose and 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 patel both were very very popular and charismatic leaders and they had uh, big organizational influence uh, bose gandhi debate of 1930s when bose became uh the president of the congress party so 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 bashne in his book basically writes that uh one shudders to think what would have happened to india if instead of nehru bose or patel would have become the prime minister uh, first prime minister of the country uh so i think depending upon your uh ideological position today you would have a, a point of view on 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 that particular question but i think in a diverse country like india the passing of baton from britishers and and basically to the liberal elite it allowed india to remain democratic uh perhaps uh, with some deficiencies and everything but if we would have gone other way uh, and by that i don't mean uh, bose or patel but if a conservative politician would have sort of like got the baton i think the very much idea of democracy in india would have been in danger so this counterfactual thought experiment i sort of like tells me that okay uh, there were uh, the discourse in the beginning was dominated by liberal elite who sort of presented them as patrons of masses but in doing so at least they germinated the idea of democracy in our country no and that's a there's a fascinating insight in that thought experiment in the sense that as you correctly pointed out that of all the ideas of india which could have won out there is only one idea of india which would have allowed the others to contest it and emerge so today if you have say some would argue that the idea of india which is on the ascendant today is not just the idea of narendra modi but also the idea of vallabhbhai patel and mm-hmm. this is maybe mm-hmm. the direction he would have liked to uh take uh, india in though i don't think that's exactly correct but some would make that point then the point to be made there is that other idea has em- emerged and triumphed in our democracy because we first ensured that it was a liberal democracy to yes, begin with yes yes that's actually the most satisfying answer of all the ones that my guests have given me so far um, you've kind of described the uh, sort of the contestations around statism uh before we go in for a break tell me a little bit about the contestations around recognition so uh, i i think we discussed some of it uh, especially on yeah. the reservation debate but also on the question of majoritarianism which is basically whether the indian state should hew to majoritarian tendencies or it should uh, become more accommodative of uh, re- religious minorities so i think we didn't do enough justice on that question in terms of like uh, there was ambivalent in the position of of leaders at the time of independence and i think that's what ideological conflict do right it allows you to sort of like mitigate on certain questions but on other questions you have to be accommodated of the opposition so we create a secular state but we allow uh, in our directive principles uh, that we will think about uh, ucc we will think about uh, religious conversion we will allow uh, we'll think about uh, what to do with animal husbandry and cow slaughter right so in in some ways and many many have pointed out it has become a practice that anything any government functions in, in india happens through a hindu ritual now you could say that this is a cultural practice but then by following one sort of cultural practice you are basically towing to the majoritarian uh, ritual practice uh, so so i think that's the reflection of of the ideological conflict as well as some scholars have gone to the extent of saying that what emerged in 1950s 
was a hindu state explain that uh that that basically we were more accommodative of uh hindu majoritarian demands uh then basically liberal secular but but the point that the bjp has uh, throughout made the jansang made before it and the bjp has kind of made is that the congress's version of secularism what they call pseudo secularism was uh, pandering to minorities so i think perhaps in practice congress ended up doing that so secularism which was a matter of conviction of our founding fathers because the idea of india would not have survived without a secular india slowly became a politics of convenience a politics of compulsion but it, it it's no longer a matter of sort of like ideological conviction but basically uh, and, and and i think bjp's opposition is that that they do sort of appeasement of muslims and and they haven't done anything to uplift the, those population and i think to some extent that charge is not wrong what the secular or so called secular parties did they basically sort of like used muslim elites to mobilize muslim population but did not do enough for the muslim masses in that sense and and, and come to think of it right in 60 years congress ruled most of the states how many muslim chief ministers can you think outside the state of uh, assam and uh, jammu kashmir where given the population you, you will have a natural uh, choice as a muslim chief minister i can remember only perhaps one example from uh, maharashtra uh, and six month period for uh, i don't remember the name but in bihar right other state congress never made muslim chief ministers how many sort of like muslim ministers or mps came out from from the congress party or other uh, secular parties so the bjp is being now able to mobilize not just on the question of secularism but also on the question of social justice right because what they have managed to convince a large section of indian population that again this was basically so politics of reservation for obc was not a obc politics it was just for yadavs in north india right politics uh, reservation for dalits was not meant for uh, all scs it was just meant for jatavs uh, in uh, hindi heartland and i think what bjp has managed to do is exploit the fault lines on both the social justice secularism as well as some sort of like nationalism patriotism angle i love the way your eyes light up when we talk about politics we're going to take a brief break now and we're going to come back and get a little deeper into the nitty gritties of how indian politics has evolved through these ideological cleavages as you put it hey everybody welcome to another week on the ivm podcast network if you're not following us on social media please make sure you do we're ivm podcast on facebook twitter and instagram as i have asked you guys before if you're finding what you listen to interesting then please take a screenshot of what you're listening to send us a note with it tag us on social media we'll either you know talk about it we'll take the feedback into consideration or we'll repost it we just really appreciate getting feedback like that as do all of our hosts also want to mention the fact that we're still hiring at the best place on earth to work in which is the ivm podcast network so if you're interested please do send us an email to careers at indusfox.com One other thing I wanted to mention that this is the week of the crossover. We have not one, not two, not three, but four crossovers this week on the network. Hosts from one show are showing up on another. And so if you'd like to listen to your favorite host in a different context, stay tuned and find out where they appear. On the Ronnie Screwballer podcast, Ronnie talks to me about the importance of focus, empathy and choices and how those three aspects have formed the crux of his journey. On Cider says we have a crossover episode as film and TV journalists and hosts of the podcast on the very IVM network that you're listening to right now, Mr. and Mrs. Binge Watch, Anirudh and Janice Sequera talk to Cyrus about how spouses with different tastes in TV get along, how to interview celebrities and the onslaught of remakes. On Ganatantra, Alok and Sir, you talk about the institutional tug of war between the judiciary and the political executive over appointment of high court and Supreme Court judges. You can also catch Ganatantra host Alok Prasanna Kumar as a guest on the Pragati podcast talking to Pawan Srinath about how India's anti-defection law has undermined democracy. On a simplified shorty, Chuck Narayan and Shree can talk about all of the other unusual variants of cricket which are played around the world. Things like whoop cricket and stuff like that. I think you'll enjoy that. On Keeping It Queer, Naveen and Farhad are joined by Mr. Gay World India, Suresh Ramdas. He throws light on gay pageants and why this representation matters. On States of Anarchy, Anohita Majumdar of Himal South Asian joins Humsini to discuss the crackdown on press freedoms across South Asia. 
On paperback, the founder of Arugula and Company, Niharika Goenka, joins Satyajit and Racheta to discuss her secrets to the healthy lifestyle and books that motivate her thoughts. And with that, let's get you on with your show. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with Rahul Verma, co-author with Pratip Chibbar of the excellent thought-provoking book, Ideology and Identity. Uh, it'll give you new insights into Indian politics, so do pick it up. Uh, continuing from where we left, you you kind of described how the you guys disagree with the notion that Indian politics isn't ideological. You pointed out that what we think of as a typical ideological cleavages of the West uh, don't apply to India, but we have our own ideological cleavages which have come from our history. One around statism, the role of the state in the redesigning society or the economy, and two around the politics of recognition. Now, uh, what you also do in your book is that you tackle people's uh, descriptions of what Indian politics actually is about. For example, people say Indian politics is all identity politics based around vote banks. People say it's patronage politics and voters are basically bribed during elections and so on and so forth. So tackle them one by one for me as far as uh, identity politics is concerned, you're obviously not taking an absolutist position that identity doesn't matter because the title of your book is Ideology and Identity. But tell me a little bit about your thinking on this and how do you test for the importance of identity in the views that people hold? Okay. Uh, so, as you rightly said, uh, uh, we're not uh, sort of taking that position that identities don't matter. In fact, one part of me deeply believes that your ideological position are also related to your social identities because given that the ideological conflict is on the question of identity, right? If it's about accommodating lower caste or religious minorities into body politics, then it, it, it is related to your identity. Similarly, your identities determine in what kind of social and economic norms you are embedded in. And if state is going to change that, then again, you are sort of like interacting with uh, the identity portion. What we sort of like disagree with, that there is some sort of like determinism attached to your identities. As if identities alone determine what you are going to sort of like your policy preferences are going to be and which political party uh, you're going to vote for. And, and these kind of like debates or talks become much more common during elections in India where all conversations start and begins with caste. Uh, as if you are born into a certain caste and you are going to vote for a particular political party. And the way politics in India is changing, I think it is leaving many more people surprised because we started with that Assumption. So what we are basically doing in one of the chapters, trying to sort of distangle identity and ideological platform. And so in the world I come from, where I was doing my PhD, there's a particular way of sort of like writing things. So you make a theoretical point, you also take on the counter arguments, and then you provide evidence for your theoretical point. Um, and there are, then there are new methods being developed to test for some of these uh, questions. So how do you separate identity and ideology? That was the question for us. So what we basically do in that chapter, use evidence from a survey experiment to show that despite your identity, whatever caste or religion you were born into or practice, it doesn't, though it may be correlated with your ideological platform, but it is not deterministic in that sense. So that's what we do uh, is basically showing that Prejudice does play a role, but there is an independent effect of your ideological beliefs on what you sort of do. So I, I, I have two kind of uh, questions here. Uh, one is that while it's obviously correct to say that identity is not deterministic, and, and you might even be arguing with a straw man there because who says it is, but while it's correct to say that identity is not deterministic, uh, like you can't look at an individual and say that his identity or her identity determines her, um, the way she will vote. But you can look at a group and say that it is likely that this group will feel this way because of its identity. An example being that I think it's fair to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the average upper caste person would be against reservations 
or the average middle class person would be against redistribution or high taxation and i'm not going into the merits of any of these policies yeah, yeah. that they, they are more complicated but these are sort of the positions that they would hold on average and therefore there is something to be said about identity determining even one's ideological position which brings me to the second point where you've got these very interesting surveys in your books and you've got a lot of data which shows that people's positions on certain issues like reservations could be a partly determined by identity but are partly also determined by ideological position or other first principles which they come from but my sort of um, uh, how i teased that out is by asking you that could it not be the case that many of those counter views uh, many of those ideological positions that appear to come from first principles are rationalizations of a tribal instinct that they feel arising from their identity like how, how can you you know um, account for that so you're right i think uh, that deterministic point was a bit uh, uh, far fetched uh, or a stretch but think of what you said all political parties are rooted in social cleavages not just in india across the world okay. right if you look at democrats in united states a large portion of their votes would come from african americans and uh, white poor and hispanics and immigrants and Whereas, therefore the argument can be made in fact uh, i'm just thinking aloud sorry for interrupting no, you no, please. but the idea can also be made that a lot of that politics is actually more based on identity than people previously would realize and less based on ideology and again i'm just thinking aloud that could possibly account for the rightward drift of the uh, republican party in recent times where a lot of the previously uh, about ideological principles like earlier ideologically they were for free trade but um, uh, now they no longer seem to be so as they're all behind trump so you could argue that a lot of those ideological positions were positions of convenience and it all boils down to identity at the end of the day so so the two in fact three questions so let me tackle first two uh so yes there is a relationship between identity and voting for a particular party but why are they doing so because that particular political party espouses some policy platforms that are closer to their identity and those policy platforms are actually those ideological beliefs right why does a dalit vote for a bahujan samaj party in uttar pradesh because they think that bahujan samaj party takes care of dalit interest right and that's the idea this is so when i was talking about the determinism it is not because i was born into this category and i have a leader belongs to that category and we like each other is basically because i think that this party takes care of my interest and interests are basically reflected in your ideological uh, leanings right so that's the limited point i was trying to make there the second i think what you are trying to suggest is that parties leave their position and they sort of take up new position so it's a matter of convenience you can say that but then this ideological space which is structures or undergrids the conflict and party politics is not a static space political parties in some ways organizationally dynamic they will keep bringing in new voters leaving out some old voters and that's why the ideological space not just because of the time and space but because of the groups that you sort of like take into that ideological space will also keep moving and sometimes it is moved by that's the third point it is moved by leaders right and and that's one of the chapters where we talk about people are not attached to leaders because they just like the leader because leaders basically represent a kind of sort of become a heuristic or a hint for the ideological platforms they want to sort of like believe in and i think one of the points which you were sort of bringing up and it's a hard uh question to answer is basically whether they like the leader and then decide the platform which you were mentioning in the case of uh, uh, uh political party and identities uh, or they have a policy platform and then they find the leader closest to that policy platform or is not so much leader and policy platform like another contestation i had you know in your book where at some point you seem to imply that uh, like in terms of statism obviously uh, i 
totally agree with you about the statism cleavage that exists around uh, the state remaking society. But as far as the state uh, remaking the economy is concerned, I think there are very, very, very few people like me who would want the state to not interfere with the economy and would allow markets to play a hand. And I think that a lot of the people in 2014 who supported Modi, some of them were taken in by the rhetoric, hmm. but a lot of them were perhaps couching their innate preference for some of the other positions of the BJP, like their positions on Muslims or cow slaughter or whatever, and instead making it sound respectable by talking about economic freedoms where they didn't really give a damn about economic freedoms. So it, it, it's not that they decide to support a, um, a, a particular leader, huh. but it's like, okay, I do not like Muslims, but I cannot say that. And therefore, I will uh, say that I want free markets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but 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 that's a very uh, so so what you say which is, is which is identity couched as ideology. Uh, so on the question of majoritarianism, you, no, but you are expressing. So you you're not saying, but by voting for that particular political party, it may not be your top priority, right? So so you may be actually so so that's a very different thing. What you're saying that. You're voting for that particular political party which espouses anti-Muslim view and you have voted for the anti-Muslim view, but you don't want to say that out loud. Right. Uh, and so you're saying it's, it's uh, but but is being anti-Muslim, why are you being, is it just prejudice against Muslims or do you think you have problems with Muslims because there are some interest involved. They are taking away your resources. They are given more preference by the government. Why do you not like Muslims? I am saying that there are perhaps a substantial number of people who are simply bigoted hmm. and who couch their bigotry in more respectable terms. So they will find a way to couch, like they will rail against the pseudo secularism of the Congress, which is actually a point with a lot of merit. But they might be uh, bringing that point up for other reasons. Or they might be saying that, no, you know, we need uh, minimum government, maximum uh, governance, which, of course, in reality hasn't happened at all. Under Modi, we've had maximum government, uh, minimum governance. Uh, but, uh, you know, they will couch it in respectable ideological terms. But those instincts will be based around identity. I'm just hypothesis. I, I mean, I don't mean to disagree with. No, no, no. The thesis I, I, I think your... what you are asking is a very, very important question. Uh, we don't do justice to that question in the book. And perhaps this is something to sort of like uh, think about. Because if your hypothesis about prevalence of bigotry is correct, that we have high prevalence of bigotry, the implications of that is that we should be seeing riots or communal violence almost on daily basis. We don't see that happening. I think... Uh, 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 or, or then you would argue that bigotry to violence is sort of like another... Uh, chain which it, it's to... another chain but also I'm not saying there's a high prevalence of bigotry I, I kind of have more faith in my country than that I think that hmm. there are hmm. a lot of reasons why one can vote for uh, say the BJP and uh, bigotry is just one small part of the mix there I, are a lot I of very good deny reasons that. I to vote for them what uh, you're asking is, is yeah. uh, and is... also I completely like we'll talk about leadership a little uh, later uh, in the episode but I also agree that uh, you know, uh, Modi as a transformational leader, a lot of his support, especially in these recent elections, when you consider the broad base of the support and the number of Dalits who voted for Modi, a lot of it is not because of identity, it's definitely because of ideology. And that almost, in fact, proves very emphatically the point that you're making. So I didn't um, really mean, mean to sound as if no, I'm no, no, no. In, yeah. I, I like that. I like those questions. In fact, <laughs> yeah. some a pushback is very, very important because... Uh, this is not the end of the research on ideology and, and party system. This is the beginning of it. And, and of course, uh, the beginning of the research, there are going to be lots of mistakes. There are a lot of going to be deficiencies. And, and these questions will make us think hard and perhaps come up with better answers. No, and you've made me, uh, through your book, you, you, you guys have made me question my prior assumptions. So, in, in a sense, maybe this is just reflexive. I'm fighting back. <laughs> but, uh, another point that you kind of bring up, and, and uh, uh, again, you're not taking an absolutist position, it's important to say, is, is for example, voter bribery, right? Where you say that it is simplistic to say that voters are bribed during elections. That's not quite how it is. Can you elaborate on that a little? Uh, so now there is a large literature on developing countries, which basically describes them, these countries as patronage democracies, clientelistic politics, where basically the one line summary of this argument is 
that voters in these countries vote for a politician in exchange of some goodies uh, that could range from job expectation of job to a sari a samosa or some cash uh, now we're not saying that these things are not there in our elections uh, basically that would mean we are closing eyes and not looking at what is happening and so all of this like cash supply or distribution of these goodies are there but what we are sort of challenging is that the vote is not contingent upon whether i receive an item or not it has become like a so it's not quid pro quo but it's ante up quid pro quo where basically like a poker game uh, the political culture in la- and this is not a good thing in last 70 years have e- evolved in a way that all politicians have to put in money and and that will s- sort of like make them seem winnable or competitive to be in the race but that would not sort of determine whether they are going to win the election for sure or not but if you don't put in money you're surely going to lose so it's like a hygiene factor i think our mutual friend milan vaishnav who in fact yes. introduced us uh, made this point in his podcast with me where he kind of said that uh, you know whether bribery works or not all parties have to at least uh, uh, um um offer a bribe and a counterpoint to doesn't that then make bribery the rigor for example and it also depends on like bribery is not just giving a sack of rice or a pressure cooker or whatever there are sort of policy bribes for example farm loan waivers we've kind of reached the equilibrium in this country where it is understood that to win an election that is one of the things you will have to do offer a farm loan waiver which often in the short immediate term i think provides uh, even a necessary anesthetic for farmers sometimes but is nowhere near the long term solution that we need to do and we absolutely. don't carry out those long term structural reforms absolutely I, i i completely agree with you and that's why we think that despite this ideological conflict uh the political culture is such that competitive populism in our politics is going to continue and 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 the limited point we wanted to sort of make through this chapter is that these goodies or even uh, bribery by the incumbent in form of policy happens during all party regimes and if this was driving our electoral politics incumbents would always have a leg up and they should be returning back not just as mps mlas and government one of like we have a big example on 2017 up election where akhilesh yadav ran a government which was patronage by rule book he in fact targeted almost every kind of voter that was possible and akhilesh by no mean uh, was running so his government may have been a little bit unpopular but he was certainly seen as a popular leader and despite that they not just lost the elections but lost it badly so the limited idea we are m- making there is influence of the so these goodies are very much part of our election game a lot of cash is sort of like needed to build the campaign in a short period of time but the vote is not contingent upon this vote is very much an independent choice it is partly driven by identity partly driven by ideology maybe at margins some votes will be getting influenced by these goodies and welfare policies but to describe this as a patronage democracy or a clientelistic politics is a little bit of a stretch That's a fair point, and and you're making a nuanced point. You're not being absolutist and saying that bribery doesn't matter at all. You're saying it's multifactorial. This might be one of the factors. Let's not overstate it. Just to needle you, I say I I used to write limer- weekly limericks for the Times of India. So mm. just to needle you, I'll quote a limerick about exactly this subject. It's I think it's called politics, mm. and the limerick is a neta who loves currency notes told me what his line of work denotes. It is kind of funny. We steal people's money. and you some of it to buy their votes <laughs> stop good no but uh, your book is perhaps a, a response to that let's move on to uh, another subject which you know you uh, you brought up a moment ago and i found your chapter on it quite fascinating which is uh, the subject of leadership where you point out that there are really two kinds of leaders in politics especially indian politics uh, and one kind is driven by ideology tell me a little bit more about this uh so and it's related to this uh, logic of bribery and 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 
patronage. So a lot of research in political science is basically focused on these uh, small time fixers uh, or very local level politicians whom we describe as transactional leaders uh, that I will do something for you and you vote for me. And, and so the focus has been on these fixers and brokers and local level politicians. What political science, and, and this is like a serious problem within political science, that we don't study leaders. Leaders of sort of like, not just prime ministers or chief ministers, but basically people who have influence in a large part of society. And the reason they have a large influence, because they project themselves as transformational. They may not turn out to be transformational, but the vision they project is that they are going to transform society. And because of that kind of vision, they can not only enthuse their own party cadres, but they inspire a large swathe of masses. And, and there is uh, some measurable impacts, which we show in the book. But think of the politics in this country is not shaped by these local level brokers and local level politicians. Political parties are moved in, moved in the system by these big influential leaders. As soon as you think of Lalu Yadav, uh, you may sort of like imagine something about him of being a backward caste politician, right? Mayavati, a Dalit politician, or, or, or Narendra Modi, a Hindu Hidesh Samrat. You attach some ideas with all these leaders, right? And, and that's why what, what we are trying to make the case in this chapter is these leaders who project themselves as transformational portray an ideological vision and, and they structure or shape party politics in the country. And uh, yeah, and and so transactional leaders tend to be more local, whereas transformational leaders are, you know, many of the great names that uh, have uh, walked on the Indian political landscape, like Indira Gandhi, Anna Durai, uh, M. G. Ramchandran, um, uh, Narendra Modi, uh, to the present day, Mayawati and Kanchi Ram are, are all transformational leaders because there is a broader ideological. A view that they have hmm. uh, and a specific place they uh, have on the issues of both statism and uh, 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 recognition hmm. that uh, appeals to people. Yeah, and, and, and think of like in 2014 and 2019, journalists and political scientists and common people alike would talk about a Modi effect in the election. What does Modi effect mean? Is it just about Modi's personality? He was not promising them that uh, you vote for me, I will get a road in uh, next to your house or I'll offer you a samosa or sari or 500 rupee note and you might be offering 15 like that's a different thing but, but the idea is the, even when, when we talk about Narendra Modi Narendra Modi represents some vision and he can very well articulate that vision and perhaps that is the reason of, of his popularity because there is clarity of articulation on one side of the ideological spectrum and there is disarray on the other side and that increases the gap, which uh, sort of like creates some Modi effect. No, and as I'll ask you to elaborate on as we're ending the episode a little later, uh, will be essentially how Modi's transformational appeal, as it were, is so vast that he actually, I think in this election, more Dalits voted for uh, the BJP than for Congress. Yeah, th that had happened in 2014. In, in 2014 also. Yeah. And, and in fact, the Dalit leader, Jignesh Mevani, uh, had a, a lament on Twitter rather about how he doesn't understand why so many Dalits are voting for the BJP. And given, you know, where the BJP once stood on the politics of recognition is surprising, but it's also very interesting how, uh, you know, Modi has managed to, on the basis of his leadership, sort of widen uh, the base of his party, as it were. What I'm going to ask you to do and what I found very um, sort of insightful and uh, if I had one feedback for the book, I would ask you, why did this come so late in the book where you talk about the four different political periods uh, in, in the political evolution of uh, India, which is like really fascinating to me. So just kind of take me through those four periods. Okay. So it comes late into the book because we are boring political scientists and we have sort of like a way of presenting the material, right? Theory, counter argument, evidence, and then what are the implications, right? What is the big picture implication of this? Uh, so, so that's a Dandamar way of writing things. Uh, 
the, so what we are basically it's a rereading of of Indian political history. So uh, there is a consensus among political scientists uh, that. Uh, 1952 to 67 was the first phase of party system where Congress was a dominant uh, party. Uh, political scientists like me care about party system because it structures the rules of the competition. Uh, so in some ways, as a voter, you are going to choose from the menu that you are going to get. And so party system in some ways is presenting you the effective choices that you have. And what I found particularly interesting about your analysis was that you were talking about these four different periods in the context of the ideological cleavages in your book, which is statism and recognition. So kind of take me through that, that, you know, where was the Congress in that first period with regard to those two? How did that change? How did it evolve? So, so uh, I would sort of like now ask you to imagine a three-dimensional space where if if you have uh, one axis of recognition and other axis of statism, Congress in the beginning is sort of sitting at the center, the large umbrella political party sitting at the center. Then on the right, you have lots of smaller political parties. So Bharatiya Jan Sangh, uh, Ram Rajam Parishad of uh, Karpatri Maharaj, Hindu Mahasabha, later on in 60s, you get uh, Swatantra Party. So there were lots of these parties. On the other side, you had lots of socialist parties. So, Praja Socialist Party, Kishan Mazdoor Party, Communist Parties. So, so these were there in the beginning. What happens in 1967? Dominance of Congress in the beginning, Congress is sitting so, at the so center. So, this way, just to clarify, then the Congress is doing both a certain amount of statism and the politics of recognition. But those on the left, the communists and the socialists and all feel not enough. Yes. And those on the right say that no, the state should not interfere with society so much and no, don't give reservations. Th th that is correct. So, so actually, the first split in the Congress, first big, so there was a split uh, around uh, 1906 uh, when the Surat Congress got split. But I think uh, in 1930s and 40s, when we are closer to the independence, there were politicians who you would describe as socialist or communist within the Congress party. So Congress was the large national umbrella movement. The socialist wing of the Congress party felt, and at one point Nehru was part of, of that uh, uh, group, uh, felt that the Congress leadership is not doing enough on their policy platform. So they leave the Congress party and form the Congress Socialist Party in 1934, which later on becomes the uh, Praja Socialist Party and KMPP and then Socialist Party. So that's the linear. So the what you would in traditional sense think of the socialist within the Congress left the Congress pre-independence and slowly uh, the process was complete by 1950s, 60s. And then you had lots of these right-wing players. So Congress was basically sitting in the center. In a sense, they were doing few things, but not doing enough. For example, they did appoint Kaka Kalelkar Commission on the OBC reservation, but they didn't, didn't do anything on that, right? And and similarly, on the... Uh, on, on, uh, so Hindu uh, code bill happens, but nothing happens on the uniform civil code. So they were not... They were not taking it to the logical conclusion. And whereas the right-wing parties had, had, had a very different idea. So in 67, when Mrs. Gandhi is now the prime minister of the country, she faces challenge from the right. And what she does is basically moves the Congress party closer to the council. So in fact, the 67 government had uh, Communist Party of India basically supporting uh, Mrs. Gandhi's Congress. So she moves closer to those ideological position on both, especially the statism part, between 67 and 89. In fact, she takes lots of steps related to the marriage, age, related to dowry, which basically further, in, in some ways, the traditionalists, the Hindu traditionalists within the Congress felt further marginalized, and they slowly started leaving out the Congress party. If you think of the the syndicates within the Congress party, they were in some ways the conservative politicians. In fact, Gulzari Lal Nanda, who was two-time interim prime minister, is also one of the founding members of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad. So because she moves the Congress party in one direction, now the space was created there. So right-leaning elements basically started coming together. So now, now what you see 
in 1980 as Bharatiya Janata Party is not just the Bharatiya Janata Party. It had elements of BJS, but also elements of Hindu Mahasabha, elements of Ram Rajya Parishad, elements of Swatantrata Party, elements of Congress organization, which was the split splinter group of the Congress Party. So all the conservative elements basically coalesced together and form the Bharatiya Janata Party in. 1980s and if you think of the vote share with bjp is basically getting in 89 91 this is basically the addition of all these groups uh, in what they used to get in 1960 so it's fascinating that for her personal political survival indira gandhi needs to reposition herself politically and because her opponents in the party happen to be towards hmm. the right she goes towards uh, left again we are using mm-hmm. western terms yeah. but she goes towards the left there's more statism therefore she goes towards and therefore she leaves that space which eventually coalesces all those years hmm. later hmm. into the bjp hmm. which is now a more powerful force and in fact you point out i think at one point that in the 89 or 91 elections uh, the bjp got uh, as uh, the, the same vote share as the jansang plus the swatantra the party, party in yep. the in the 60s. 1960s so it actually coalesced into that one entity and then That's grew correct. from there That's so correct. in terms of the um, the ideological issues of statism and recognition indira gandhi moved a lot towards statism and on the recognition front what was happening so recognition front what happens is basically uh, she doesn't she's standing right there which basically now opens up a space for all these socialist parties basically they were trying to do some sort of like class mobilization in the first party system post 67 they all become backward caste parties of north india so they start because nothing was happening on the reservation front so now basically the centrist congress party is caught in the middle you have basically socialist parties mobilized on, on the caste angle the right wing party is mobilizing on the religion angle and the statism angle and the communist party is saying you have not done enough on the statism so basically <laughs> congress starts getting squeezed mm. uh, so in the second party system which is 67 to 89 congress though remains dominant nationally but in the states now it is facing challenges in some places from the bjp in some places from the uh, communist in some places from the these backward caste parties or regional parties and everywhere these regional parties have come up like in tamil nadu for example yeah. dmk and nadi mk yeah. Yeah. basically yeah. Uh, yeah. running the roost then, then let's go to the third party so, system so so third then. party system basically begins uh, in 1989 when congress loses its national dominance also and we get a fragmented party system so what happens in this period that in places where congress gets regional parties which are ideologically very similar to it congress party is almost finished in that state uh, you quoted the example of tamil nadu what congress was basically doing was one time aligning with dmk one time aligning with with ai dmk basically congress party gets caught between ai dmk and dmk and is now virtually not a player in tamil nadu so, something very similar happens in uttar pradesh congress party basically is squeezed by both the presence of the samajwadi party and bahujan samaj party and come to think of it the reason is that congress it is hard to distinguish ideologically on the question of recognition and on the question of statism so th- these parties are indistinguishable from the congress party in fact congress party survives in the state and does well in the state where it is in direct competition with the bjp think of madhya pradesh think of rajasthan think of chatisgarh think of himachal pradesh in all these state the direct competition of the congress is bjp and these two parties are ideologically very different so therefore it can survive when uh, you know it has that positioning advantage otherwise it's yeah and and, and we, we use this example to make the point that a lot of people think that the decline of the congress was is due to leadership or due to organizational atrophy and if these two were the reasons you have the same leader you have the similar organization but the decline of congress varies across indian state depending upon who is congress party's main competitor right so you see one kind of congress which is alive and kicking uh, when it competes with the bjp but another congress uh, kind of congress party which is now defunct in states like up bihar bengal and uh, tamil nadu where you are competing with regional parties So now in this third party phase uh the, the the two big m words that come up here are mandal and mandir uh, so tell me how the resurgence of 
Mandir and the arrival of Mandal, how do they play in this ideological landscape of recognition and statism? And uh, how does that bring a lead into the fourth era which we are in right now? So in the book, basically, we mention about that perhaps 2014 is the arrival of uh, the fourth party system where BJP is going to become the focal point of competition. And now the 2019 results basically confirm that we are indeed in a BJP dominant party system. Uh, what happens, uh, you mentioned these Mandir and Mandal, which simultaneously occurs in uh, between 1989 and 1991. Now, Congress party on both question remains ambivalent. In fact, so, so think of, of the politics that is emerging, right? Somebody tells Rajiv Gandhi, the prime minister, that you lost the bipoles in 1986 because you there was some controversy related to the Shah Banu case and you didn't do enough. Rajiv Gandhi, in fact, sort of like twists the parliament's hand and passes a law. Uh, so he's basically sometimes playing with the Muslim conservative politicians and at other times he's trying to be a liberal reformist. Then someone basically tells him perhaps that now the Muslims are gone, you should think about Hindu conservative politician. So Rajiv Gandhi basically begins the 1989 election campaigns from Ayodhya. Uh, so basically playing with fire, uh, trying to do both the things. Whereas the BJP takes a very clear position on both the issue. They don't say much, at least publicly, on the question of Mandal reservation because they know it would be an electoral society to oppose reservation for such a large group. But they do prop up proxy opposition to Mandal reservation and to counter the effects of Mandal reservation, in fact, join the bandwagon of Mandir mobilization. So Ram Mandir mobilization was happening at the backdrop uh, through Vishwa Hindu Parishad and other RSS affiliates since early 1980s after the Menakshi Puram conversion in 1982. Uh, it gained momentum during late 80s and this seemed like a good opportunity for them to counter uh, the effects of Mandal and create a pan-Hindu identity. So because BJP took some sort of like clear position the first effect uh, of, of that was that the upper caste basically thought that this party takes care of their ideological platforms. They left Congress en masse in the Hindi heartland and joined the BJP. Congress is not doing so is ambivalent on these positions, whereas regional parties were clear, like uh, the SP was clear on the question of reservation and also in some ways uh, sided uh, on the position which Muslims would have wanted them to take on Ram Mandir mobilization. And they got the benefit of, of that. So there were two parties which took clear position. The Congress didn't do anything. And that's why basically Congress slowly faded in the Hindi heartland of UP and Bihar. So bring me now to the fourth uh, party era. So in 2014, what you see is emergence of BJP as... Uh, the principal pole of Indian politics and uh, 2019 basically now cements the BJP's pole position. Now, what is likely to happen, and this is a working paper on 2019 elections from where I'm sort of like going to make the case, that it seems, and so far the conversation seems on short-term factors which led to Modi's victory, which is basically the leadership popularity, the organizational advantages BJP has, or uh, their successful presentation of 2019 as a national election and using national security platform, or basically removing inconveniences through massive welfare schemes such as Ujwala and other things. While these factors are definitely important, the reason I think think BJP is becoming the dominant pole of Indian politics is large structural shifts that are taking place in Indian society. The first one is uh, very simply that the size of the middle class is increasing, the size of the urban population is increasing, the size of educated voters is increasing, the size of people who are more media, sort of like exposed to more media is increasing. And these and guys these are, are likely to be against both statism and recognition. These, these guys are essentially in some ways uh, BJP voters. Uh, and, and so what is happening is that the size of the BJP the pie from which BJP can draw is increasing. But just increase in demographic share 
does not mean that they are uh, more likely to vote for the BJP. Uh, the second thing I think what is happening is basically on, so we don't have good evidence on, on statism, but there is clear clarity on politics of recognition scale uh, playing a role in basically bringing these new groups to the BJP fold. One, I think what is happening, political majoritarianism is increasing. And second, uh, the BJP's use of this EWS quota to change the whole debate on recognition and affirmative action is, is bringing these new group of voters. And what is interesting, and I don't have a good answer right now, it seems that political majoritarianism is, is not linked to Hindu nationalism. And why this point is important, because if it was old style Hindu nationalistic politics, I don't think you would have got an increase in vote share of Dalits and lower OBCs for the BJP. So I think the old Hindu nationalistic card was rooted in upper caste sensibilities, whereas this new Modi political majoritarianism is devoid of those upper caste uh, biases. And it's a new kind of sort of majority. I mean, he's an OBC himself. And mm. as you point out in your book, some of the reasons for the rise of an OBC like Modi to power and the BJP have to do with Govindacharya's decision in the 90s mm. to sort of widen uh, the social base of uh, uh, the BJP, which, you know, brings me to two questions I'll kind of end the episode with because we're running out of time. But, uh, you know, there are tons of fascinating material in your book. Another question I wanted to ask was you've got a very good analysis about the decline of the Congress and why many of the traditional reasons trotted out by people don't necessarily work. Um, but as we don't have time for that in this episode, but I hope uh, my listeners will go buy your book instantly and read it, uh, support good scholarship. Uh, but my, my both my questions are essentially about the BJP. One of them is that w one of the things that Amit Shah has been doing as a political strategist is sort of widening the base, but w widening the base can also in some ways mean diluting the ideology or what the party stands for. For example, they are getting um, sort of uh, defections from other parties almost indiscriminately now anyone who wishes to join and can bring a base with him just join and then that you know so it's a question of will to power versus ideology the will to power is fantastic but doesn't this dilute the ideology and what the party actually stands for question number one and and question number two as you point out the increasing urbanization of and this was one of the very interesting points towards the end of your book that the increasing urbanization of india makes Another kind of uh, fissure um, uh, apparent where a, a lot of the people who sort of support Modi for multiple reasons now will not have those multiple reasons to support him in future. So uh, just elaborate on that. That's, that's correct. I think so BJP is now a dominant party, but will it remain a dominant party for a long time? They need to, so, so there are emerging contradictions within the coalitions that has brought BJP to power and they have to work on it. Uh, you are absolutely right about basically BJP taking in politicians from outside and whether it would dilute ideology. Now that remains an open question because political parties are not just there to sort of like follow an ideological doctrinate, but primary reason they exist because they want to be in power. So given that there is some sort of like Vinability factor associated in bringing these politicians, all political parties would do that. But is BJP going to sort of like allow these new kind of politicians to run the show and not tow its ideological line? I think if they do that, they would be in trouble with their ideological sort of like uh, fountainhead and there would be sticks from uh, Rashtriya Swayam Swayam Sangh. In fact, there have been warning signs after this election. They are continuously trying to push back that don't make it a personality-centric government or personality-centric election or on personalities. This is a victory of our ideas. The second point, I think uh, we must uh, sort of like keep this in mind and that, that happens with all political parties. When you expand, you bring in not just different sort of like politicians who don't share your ideology, but you also bring voters who are not part of your core support group. Now, they will come to you and vote for you, 
but they, they would want something in return. They would want representation. This is what happened with the Congress parties in 1970s. It was getting vote from all segments of the society, but large part of Congress leadership remained upper caste. Uh, so basically... Uh, many leaders moved out and formed different political parties and and the decline of the Congress thus began. It would happen with the BJP also if the party remains uh, upper caste in its leadership structure. Uh, For some time, when you have a charismatic personality like Modi, these contradictions would be sort of like subdued. But once someone like Modi goes and you don't have a replacement, these would unravel like anything. The final point, which is important, that we have to understand the changing context in India. So BJP, in some ways, practices conservative politics on social norms. But large segment of voters which are voting for BJP are receiving global messages and we are, as much we will get integrated into global economy, they would re- receive very different kind of messages and aspire very different kind of life. So they might be voting Modi for fulfillment of certain aspirations. But if on other parameters they feel threatened by the politics of BJP, that would create its own sort of like contradictions and fissures. And I think that is where the BJP's challenge lies, to be able to manage these contradictions and hold on to the ideological coalition they have created. In fact, you could argue that, you know, the fact that they won in 2014 and 20. 19 is almost like a perfect storm of events coming together, managing to draw all these disparate social groups who are not yet this enamored of the BJP. And there's a telling line from uh, uh, your book when you talk about the growing urban voter where you say, quote, the young may hold their noses and vote for the BJP, especially because of a lack of credible ideological alternatives. But this support will not last because this group is not enamored of majoritarian politics stop quote which is interesting and is it also the case that there might be people who might feel that the bjp led by modi in this sort of broad-based avatar is not doing enough for the hindu cause it is possible (laughs) right uh rahul has been fantastic talking to you i learned a lot uh, today thank Thank you you so much much for coming on the show thank you for those questions i i enjoyed it If you enjoyed listening to the show, head on over to your nearest bookstore online or offline and pick up Ideology and Identity by Pradeep Shibbar and Rahul Verma. You can follow Rahul on Twitter at Rahul underscore T Verma. You can follow me at Amit Verma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. Don't make a mistake. You can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in, thinkpragati.com and ibmpodcast.com. The Scene and the Unseen is supported by the Takshishila Institution, an independent center for research and education and public policy. Takshishila offers 12-week courses in public policy, technology policy and strategic studies for both full-time students and working professionals. Visit takshishila.org.in for more details. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Satyajit. Hi, I'm Racheta. We are from the Open Library Project and we host a podcast called Paperback. Paperback is a podcast where we engage with stalwarts and experts from various industries suggesting non-fiction titles that contributed to their journey in a big way. We've had guests like Anjali Rena, Dr. Marcus Rani, Dr. Swati Loda, Ambi Parmeswaran, Apurva Damani and many more on our show Paperback. Find new episodes every Wednesday on IVM Podcast app, website or wherever you listen to podcasts. How aware do you think you are of your laws and rights? Do you look up to laws when you are caught up in situations? Do you know what your rights are when you are stuck somewhere bad? Well, here is a show that can help you move an inch closer to being aware of what your rights are. Tune in to Know Your Kanoon with me, Amar Rana. This is a podcast meant to answer all your law-related queries. Catch Know Your Kanoon every week on the IVM website or the app or anywhere you get your podcast from.